crux probat omnia is a Latin phrase which means the cross is the test of everything. And it was a phrase used by Martin Luther. And in very much the same fashion, we can say that Galatians is Paul's crux probat omnia as he brings this church to consider to consider their justification in the light of the cross, the test of the cross. Whatever fails the cross is not accepted in the sight of God. Paul had visited this Galatian region twice, and shortly after his second visit, the Judaizers had come in and were starting to convince the church that it was necessary to supplement the gospel, that it was necessary to add to the gospel through Jewish observances and rites. In order to be accepted with God, they insisted that we needed gospel plus, these different observances. It's not new to us. We often have people wanting to add to the gospel, wanting to supplement the gospel. And yet right at the end of this epistle, he says this, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He declares this as his boast or his glory. And my desire tonight is that we could, in a cautious manner, I would suggest with much trembling, for when we approach the cross, it is on holy ground that we walk. And we will look at this boast and what it means and glean from it in a devotional manner to try and understand what it means to boast in the cross of Christ. When he says here to boast in the cross of Christ, he's saying to boast in Christ crucified. And Christ crucified is the heart of the gospel, and Paul is boasting in the gospel. And in the gospel, he points out that the cross of Christ is the very heartbeat of this gospel. But how do we boast in the cross? What does it mean to boast in the cross? We will look at this tonight in three different points. What does it mean to boast in the cross of Christ? Firstly, it's never to forget the one and the why. Never forget the one and the why. In Galatians 1 verse 4, Paul says these words, and you read over them so quickly, but just pause with me and think about this. He says this, who gave himself for our sins. Who gave himself for our sins in 1 verse 4. Who gave himself, that's the one, and for our sins, that's the why. Lamb of God for sinners slain. He repeats this phrase again in chapter 2, this idea that God gave himself, that Christ willingly, willingly, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay down my life for the sheep. And Paul says, he gave himself, that's the one, for our sins, that's the why. Let's consider the one. Paul never gets over this. And we should never get over this, the fact that Christ has given himself. Paul never gets over this. He repeats this phrase in other epistles as well. Consider the one, brothers and sisters. Consider the one. Who is the one? Consider his majesty. Consider his glory. Consider his worthiness, his value. Consider his excellence. His excellence. But consider the why for sinners. For vile sinners like you and me, the majesty on heaven would give himself. That's shocking. It's shocking. The sinners, the one, the glorious one who hid Moses in the cleft of the rock, that one, that one who Isaiah saw and couldn't bear and he felt undone, that one gave himself. The sinners. Paul boasts in the cross by never forgetting the one and the why. It's at the cross that we see the nature of God and it's at the cross that we see the nature of sin. It's at the cross that we mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load. It is the word, the Lord's anointed, Son of Man, and 
Son of God. Boasting in the cross is to never forget the one and the why. The one and the why is the praise of heaven. Consider Revelations 5, 9. It says, Worthy are you, that's the one, to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, that's the why. The one and the why. Again, worthy is the lamb, that's the one, who was slain, that's the why. He was slain for us. He gave himself for me is the only basis for God accepting us. It's the only basis upon which God will accept us. How could we or anyone add to what Christ has offered? How could the Galatians, how could anyone think of adding to what Christ has offered on the cross? Christ reveals his worth at the cross. Christ reveals his worth at the cross because he was the only one who could answer our why. Who else could have done it? No one. Who else would have done it? He was the only one at the cross. We boast because we see the King of glory becoming the King of Calvary. The Son of God becoming the Son of suffering. The lofty and exalted one becoming the lowly Lamb of God. Paul reminds the Galatians and God reminds us tonight to never forget the one and the why. Brothers, it's shocking. Just think. Just think about it. Think of the one who gave himself. Just think of who he is, that majesty. The second thing, how Paul boasts in the cross, is he upholds the majesty of the gospel. He upholds the majesty of the gospel. For brothers and sisters, the majesty of the gospel, as we heard this morning, that gospel which saves wicked sinners, men who were previously monsters like me, it saves. It's that majesty of that gospel. It's the majesty of the gospel. He says in Chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we have, you have, we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And then he repeats it. It's a double anathema. You see much today of people playing fast and loose with the gospel. It's a cursed thing to do that. It's a cursed thing. Why? Because of the majesty of the gospel. Why? Because of the majesty of the Savior. The gospel is majestic. And we should uphold that majesty because of the majesty of Christ. Paul confronts even Peter for his hypocrisy and he says that his conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. He shows us that no one is above the gospel. No one is above the gospel. Paul will not let the cross of Christ, which is the sum and substance of the gospel, be neglected. He says to them that you foolish Galatians in chapter 3 verse 1, It was before your eyes that Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. When Paul preached the gospel, he painted a picture of Christ crucified for them. It was the principal matter of his preaching. Where Christ crucified is not proclaimed, the gospel has not been given. The gospel has not been given where we do not have Christ crucified. Paul is in anguish and he He ascribes it to birth pains. And why is he in anguish? And why does he describe the severe inner pain? Because they've lost sight of the majesty of the gospel of Christ. They had lost sight of the cross. And when we lose sight of the cross, brethren, we lose sight of Christ. P.T. Forsyth, as a very precious quote to me, said this, Christ is to us just what the cross is. All that Christ was in heaven or on earth was put into what he did there. You do not understand Christ till you understand his cross. The gospel is the majestic message of this crucified Christ. And we are guests tonight of the crucified one. Christ crucified is the greatest act of God in the universe. The greatest act of God in the universe. 
How could we lose sight of that? I think it's helpful for us to consider something which Paul says, and I don't want to spend too much time here for fear of the verse. But it would be helpful for us to consider the depth of the gospel. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He became a curse. How can we read that with dry eyes? How could we not tremble? He became a curse for us. Just think. Just think about that. This is the depth of the gospel. He became a curse. Who could understand that? And our reason I raise that is because we've been over the Beatitudes of late and it's been a blessing to us. And all you've heard from the front of this pulpit is blessed, 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 blessed. And rightly so, as citizens of the heaven, of, of, of the kingdom, we are blessed. We are blessed as citizens of the kingdom because Christ was cursed. And we here blessed. This is the beatitude which Christ would have heard on the cross. Cursed are you for your pride and arrogance. Cursed are you for your hard and impenitent heart. Cursed are you for your violence. Cursed are you for hating righteousness. Cursed are you, unmerciful one. Cursed are you for the vileness of your heart. Cursed are you, you peace breaker. Cursed are you for the persecuting the righteous. That was the testimony of the law upon Christ. That would have thundered upon him at the cross. Cursed are you. Cursed are you. Blessed are us. This is the gospel that we have. This is what makes the gospel such a majestic message. What Christ did at the cross was an offering of his soul. It was an offering of his soul. And this is why we die for the gospel, right? This is why we die for the gospel. Why? Because no matter how great family is and life is with all its blessings, no matter how great it is to have friends and fellowship and everything, you take all of that, but the soul of Christ is greater still. Soul's, the soul of Christ is greater still. It's greater still. He became the sin bearer and therefore the curse bearer. On the cross we see the depth of what Christ suffered. Do you understand what happened at that cross? Love lingers at the cross. Have you lingered there a little? Do you understand what was happening there? This is why the gospel is so precious to us. The soul of Christ is greater than all. And the message of the gospel is the message of the offering of the Son of God, offering his soul. Why? Why? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. For our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The marrow of the gospel. The marrow of the gospel. Thirdly, a cruciform life. Paul boasts in the gospel by living a cruciform life. The cross is the weight of the gospel and the cross is the weight of our ministry. He says in part B of that verse, in 6 verse 14, he says this, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He lives a cruciform life. If you turn to Galatians 2.20, we know that verse well. He says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There's that word, that, that phrase again. He loved me and gave himself 
for me. I have been crucified with Christ. That's my justification. That's the shortest phrase you can have on justification. I have been, it's co-crucifixion. I have been crucified with Christ. That's my justification. But Christ lives in me. That's my sanctification. Note here, it's not about merely a moral ethic. It's not about ascribing, ticking some boxes and doing a few things. It's the spirit of the living God within us. It's Christ in us, which is the hope. And Paul says that's his sanctification. Paul views his life as a manifestation of the life of Christ. He says, Christ lives in me, and my life is a manifestation of the one who died for me. Can you say the same of your life? Can you say, Christ lives in me? See, Paul views this life of his as a vessel that's been given. A vessel that's only good for one thing, for Christ to live through. It's interesting to note here that the power of Christ's resurrection life is the application of his death. The power of, that's why Paul could say that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. It's the application of his death. And in this verse we see here, Paul can say that the world is crucified to him and he's to the world. He says in 5 verse 24 that he's crucified the flesh and the passions. He goes on and he says in 6 verse 14 as we have now that he's crucified, he's dead to the world and the world is dead to him. The risen and crucified Christ applies the power of his death and that death brings death to self and death to sin. What are you dead to tonight? You may well say, Christ lives in me, but what are you dead to? Are you dead to lust? Are you dead to rebelling against your parents? Are you dead to lying? Are you dead to sin? What are we dead to? If we're not experiencing, if you're not experiencing death to sin in your life, you have not experienced the death of Christ for your life. It's a cruciform life that we live. It's a cruciform life that we live. Paul says here that Christ died. He loved me and gave himself for me. And Paul sees the cross very much the same way God sees the cross, as something accomplished but ever-present in the person of Christ. Ever-present. He sees a lamb standing as though slain. Tonight we will see a lamb standing as though slain. We boast in the cross because of the lamb of God. Because a cruciform life is what Christ will bring us to live. Paul looked out from the viewpoint of the cross, and he looked upon the world and he said, my affections are his. There is nothing in this world. The appeals of this world are an appeal to a dead man. The world is crucified to him. He loved me and gave himself for me. This is what empowers Paul's life. It's what informs his ministry. This is all his motivation, all his endurance, all his passion is summed up in these words. He loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. That's why he can say in chapter 6, don't grow weary of doing good. Why? Because he loved you and he gave himself for you. That's why he can say, I bear in my body the marks of Christ, and yet he can hold no bitterness and call it a light affliction. Why? Because he loved me and gave himself for me. How else could Paul have, how, how else did Paul deal with those who slandered his ministry, belittled him, how could he forgive them and love them and pray for them? Do you know how? Because he loved me and he gave himself for me. He loved me and he gave himself for me. The cross of Christ shows us the sweetness of Christ and the bitterness of sin. And until Christ be sweet, sweet sin will not be bitter. Brothers and sisters, have you forgotten the one and the why? Are you upholding the majesty of the gospel in your home, with your children, in your devotion? Are you living a cruciform life? How could you not forgive one another? How could you not love one another? How could you have any reservation in you? 
Christ hung on that cross naked and ashamed, exposed. He was the public testimony of our sin. He had nothing left in him. There was no reservation left in him. How could we have reservation left in us? How could we? He gloried in the cross as the expiation of sin, the fulfillment of the law, the cause of reconciliation, the ransom of the church, the propitiation of our sins, and the sacrificial blood which brings us and keeps us near to God in worship. Since Christ has died, how could life ever be different? How could it ever be the same? How could anything be the same again? How could it? How, how, could, how, how could we not be changed by this? How could anything just remain the same for the one who loved us and gave himself for us? Yes, the world will offer what it wants, and yes, all the distractions will be there. But brothers and sisters, he loved you, and he gave himself for you. What else do you need? Heaven's got nothing else to give. To finish off, I suppose, the hymn of Elizabeth Buffain could sum it up well. Upon the cross of Jesus, my eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears to wonders I confess the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. I take across thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. Let's pray. Our Father, may the Lamb of God receive the reward for his sufferings. For his name's sake, amen.